Hello and welcome to the Essex Boys Murder Case Part 43. Before watching this video, I recommend watching Part 4 onwards and neutral first, as these videos are all about the key individuals and the murder victims movements on the day of the 6th of December 1995. And before we start, I'd just like to mention the Facebook page called The Real Essex Boys Murder Club. If you're interested, please feel free to join. And some great people on there uh, with a lot of knowledge on this subject. So this is the uh, final instalment of the pact which Mick and Jack made prior to the executions of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. Uh, if you haven't seen part one and part two which are the Essex Boys murder case part 41 and 42 I do recommend watching them first and before we start I will give you a quick catch up of where we go up to in these day of the murder videos now Darren Nichols has received a call from Jack at 6 59 p.m. to come and pick them up he's left Meadow Road where he was parked up and driven up to the track entrance uh, which just is a minute or so's drive away as he pulls up, Jack appears with his chip in his bag and gets into the back of the Passat. Uh, Darren Nichols turns around to speak to him and notices Jack is covered in blood splatters. Shortly afterwards, Mick Steele turns up and gets into the front passenger seat. And the time is approximately 7.05pm. Uh, so let's go on with the final instalment of a pact um, Mick and Jack made prior to the executions of the Essex boys. Did Darren Nichols get out of being an executioner on the night of the murders? Did Darren Nichols ask his associate, a Roy French, if he could get a gun for him so he could use it in the executions? Had time out for Mick and Jack to get hold of guns? Uh, so they had to use the unlicensed guns Jack had possession of. When Roy French contacted Darren Nichols saying he could get indeed get hold of any type of gun he wanted. Um, he lost his bottle and told Roy French he no longer needed one. When Dan Nichols was first interviewed in connection with these murders, he distanced him himself from giving any information on this and he never mentioned Roy French's name. Why would Dan Nichols not mention Roy French's name in the police interview? He could back up his story about wanting to purchase a gun. I mean, after all, Darren Nichols has now been offered a place on the Witness Protection Programme. He's cooperating with the police now, saying he was merely a getaway driver and had no prior knowledge the murders were going to take place. Darren Nichols and Roy French's version of events about the gun are totally different, as I explained in a previous video of the pact. Who's telling the truth? That's for you to decide. Did Dan and Nichols wait until he knew the date of the executions would take place and tell Mick and Jack he couldn't get hold of a firearm but he would still help get rid of the Essex boys? I mean, Dan and Nichols wants Pat Tate out of the way for being ridiculed by him in the hospital with Ian Spindler. Pat Tate was also threatening him through Mick Steele over the Dud Cannabis fiasco. So there's definitely motive for Darren Nichols to help get rid of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Also, he knows what Mick and Jack were planning and he's part of it. If he said he no longer wanted any part of being involved in the murders, he too could be shot as he knows too much. So... He's going to tell them he's going to be the getaway driver. He will drive ahead with Jack and anyone else to get them into position. 
After all, he knows about the track and the location as a Colin Bridge has said he and Darren Nichols drove together along the A130 past White House Farm and the track many other times. He's going to park up close by to where the executions are going to take place as he knows it's a rural location so the phone signal may be a problem. If you've been following these uh, Day of the Murder videos from part 4 onwards you will know I put the phone logs on a video that took place that day and you will know that Dan Nichols was making the calls to mix steel first. On the day of the murders Darren Nichols phoned Mick Steele's landline at 12.51pm, which is just here. Then he phones Mick Steele's mobile at 12.52pm. Then again at 12.53pm. At 12.54pm he rings his own house line. Um, then he rings Mick Steele's mobile again, which is just down here. Now, four minutes later, Mick Steele uses his landline to phone Jack's mobile. Uh, so for someone who doesn't know anything that's going to really happen later on that evening, Darren Nichols, he's, he's the one making the calls first. Eventually, he makes contact with Mick Steele, and then after that contact, uh, Mick Steele rings Jack up. Whatever Darren Nichols said when he first made contact with Mick Steele set up a chain of events for that day and that evening. If I'm to believe Darren Nichols' version of events of what he said happened that night, then to me, he's more involved. I don't believe his story about only knowing that an intended meet was made with all parties about a place uh, where a, a light aircraft uh, would be landing with drugs on board. Um, I don't believe Darren Nichols' story about Mick Steele asking him to try and ask uh, about for a firearm. It, it seems weak to me. Roy French's version of events seem more believable. Uh, with there being no mention of where Mick and Jack did get their guns from, I personally think Mick and Jack tried to buy some firearms, uh, but it was proving too difficult, so they decided to use Jack's unlicensed shotguns, and Darren Nichols knew uh, they were going to use his guns and the gun Roy French could get for him he turned down because his bottle went that is if I believe Darren Nichols version of events so after finding out Darren Nichols had pulled out of taking part in the actual executions because he told them he can't get over a firearm in time um, now he knows uh, the day of the executions, he's told them um, he's still in and will be the getaway driver. After finding out Dan Nichols would not be taking part in the actual executions and he would now be the getaway driver uh, for them, did Mick and Jack make a pact between themselves to both shoot Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe so neither could tell on the other if they were arrested and questioned over the murders. Is this why when they were both interviewed they went no comment? Even when the police told them they had been speaking to Darren Nichols about what had happened that night and he's telling a different story both Mick and Jack go, no comment. The pact has already 
be made. It would not benefit either to say the other man committed the murders because Darren Nichols has said they both shot them and it would go a long way to prove Darren Nichols was lying as he's turned supergrass and will be the police's star witness at the trial. Did Mick and Jack make a pact prior to the executions? So here we are, um, back at the entrance to the track. Has Mick and Jack made a pact that they would both shoot all three men separately so neither of them could say the other did it? Did they both agree that Mick would get them down the track? The Range Rover would stop at the five bar gate. He would get out and leave the passenger door open. This will give Jack a clear sight of Tucker, Tate and Rolf and could take them out first using a long barreled self-loading shotgun. Did Mick Steele take over and shoot all three of them and the pact was made? Um, let's take a closer look. So this is the entrance uh, to the track um, and as we all know it would have been dark at that time of the evening and um, so I've just tried to recreate what it may have looked like um, back then. Um, so did Jack get out of the Passat and tell Dan and Nichols to go wait at a pre-chosen location uh, due to them being in a rural location and the phone signals uh, not so good. Um, so it had to be close by. Now, did he walk down the track um, with the gun or guns in his chippy bag, like Darren Nichols says? Um, like I said, it would have been pitch black down this track. Uh, no lighting whatsoever. Uh, but he knows where he's going. It's about 1 minute 30 seconds or, or thereabouts to reach the five bar gate. Uh, let's say two minutes, like I say, it, it would have been pitch black, uh, so we'll give him that extra time. Uh, there is literally no lighting whatsoever as he walks down that track. Darren Nichols never mentions Jack bringing a, a torch with him to get down this track in his statements. I mean, it's pitch black down this track as he walks down with his chippy bag and... and seems to know where he's going so the only logical explanation for that is he's been down this trap before um a recce days before the murders now having gone down here uh to the five bar gate um i think the first thing he'd do is check the gear is padlocked um like he checked the evening before when he was on his last recce, uh, when his phone pinged in this area. Now, I don't think um, he placed a gun um, here um, to the left of the gate uh, where the padlock was. I know it shows this happening in the films. Um, they'd have added it for suspense as it was building up to the shootings. I mean, if Mick Steele got out of the Range Rover, left the back passenger door open and went to the left hand side of this gate, fumbling about uh, with the padlock, he's going to get spotted if he bends down for the shotgun. Remember, the Range Rover's headlamps are on and Tony Tucker and Craig Rolf would have been watching him. Even when Jack began shooting through the back passenger door, uh, Tony Tucker or, or Craig Rolf would have noticed Mick Steele bend down and come towards them uh, with a shotgun in his hand. Um, I think I've also read it somewhere uh, in Darren Nichols' statements where 
the first one where he said Jack um, passed Mick a gun. Um, so I don't think uh, Jack left, left a shotgun near the gate for Mick Steele. Um, not for me. Oh, right, back to Jack. Um, he's checked. Uh, the gate is locked. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be padlocked. Um, just shut. As this is going to create the ambush. He knows uh, where he's going to lay in wait. Uh, which is over here. Um, just over here to the right. This is where he's going to wait. Just over here in the uh, the bushes. Um, he's going to be crouched down, hidden in, in these bushes. So when the Range Rover comes down the track with the headlamps on, um, he won't be in view of them. Uh, the police found an area over here in the, the bushes, the undergrowth. Um, it had been disturbed in the last 24 hours. Um, so it's safe to say this is where the killer uh, lay in wait. Um, I mean, this track was specifically chosen for an ambush. I mean, you're not going to jump over the gate here uh, with a shotgun in full view of, of Tony Tucker um, and Craig Rolfe. It's just not going to happen. Um, you're not going to wait over here. Um, in these bushes and trees as um, you're definitely going to get spotted um, as the Range Rover goes down the track uh, with the headlamps on uh, so this is this area on the left here this is not ideal neither um, so he's definitely picked a specific part over here um, to begin the uh, ambush um, you're also going to open um, Tony Tucker, uh, or, or his, his door, or, or Pat's door, Pat Tate's door, uh, you're not, you're not going to open these doors here and get a clear shot. Um, because the, the branches and the twigs, uh, they're all going to be in the way. Um, you open Tony Tucker's door, for instance, um, Pat Tate would, would get out, Craig, Craig Rolf uh, could get out. So even... Back at the Hungry Horse pub car park, where Mick Steele got out of his eye looks and got into the Range Rover, it was imperative he sat behind Craig Rolfe. That's how much planning went into these triple murders. So if it happened the way Darren Nichols said it did, uh, then Jack would have been crouched down, over here in these bushes uh, with his chippy bag open uh, and a long barrel shotgun in his hand. If it did happen this way, I wonder what was going through Jack's mind, crouched down, waiting for the Range Rover to turn up. I mean, how long would he have been waiting? I mean, he's checked the gate. He's walked to the bushes to the right. Gets the gun out of the chippy bag and crouches down. I mean, say five minutes he's waiting in these bushes. I mean, what would have been going through his mind in those five minutes? I mean, as far as we know, he's never um, committed murder before. Um, this is the first time, apparently. I think he'd have, have switched off his mobile phone by now um, so it did not go off at a crucial time. But yeah, I mean, what would have been going through Jack's mind waiting for the, um, the headlamps to be seen in the distance and hearing the Range Rover coming down the track knowing it's time for the executions this is it. All the planning has all been done and it's down to these final stages now where the executions 
are going to take place. So, here we go. Um, Jack, here's the Range Rover um, coming down the track. And he's crouched down just over here. And the padlocked gate is just over here. Uh, and this is where the Range Rover is going to come to a halt. Just here. So Jack's over here. Crouched down. I mean, his heart must have been pumping at this time. Um, what if he was spotted by uh, Craig Rolfe or, or Tony Tucker, who was sat in the front? What if... Craig Rolfe got out of the Range Rover to go to the locked gate in, instead of Mick. Um, what if Mick uh, forgets to leave his door open? Uh, he must have been hoping everything was going to go to plan. The Range Rover was bought just a few weeks before the killing. Police want to trace anyone who's been in it. Have you been a passenger? Or do you know someone who has? The murder probably took place between 7pm and 9pm on Wednesday, December the 6th. He sees the headlamps coming down the track and heading towards the five bar gate. This is it for Jack. Uh, there's no turning back. It's too late um, to change your mind uh, and run off. Um, two weeks or so of doing reconnaissance missions to and from all these locations. Uh, the routes they had taken. All them key places um, they had chosen. The timings of all this uh, plan uh, to get Tucker, Tate and Rolf down the track for the ambush and to execute to execute them. This is it. Jack has noticed um, Mick Steele is sitting in the back passenger seat like he was supposed to. The Range Rover pulls up in front of the five bar gate. Jack has the chippy bag in one hand and a long barrelled self loading shotgun in the other. He waits for Mick Steele to get out, and as planned, he's left his door open and then walks past Craig Rolf's door and heads to the left hand side of the gate. I mean, what would have been going through Jack's mind as the Range Rover came to a halt? I mean, like I say, all that planning, everything. And, and this is the actual crucial time when the executions are going to take place. Um, so, yeah, this is it. Um, Jack has noticed. Um, uh, Mick has left the, uh, the door open. Um, Jack has the chippy bag in one hand. And a long barreled self loading shotgun in the other. Um, like I say, he waits for Mick um, to get out, and as planned, he's left uh, his door open, then walks past um, Craig Rolf's door and heads to the left hand side of the gate. This is it. Jack Wounds sets off from the bushes in a hurry. He drops the chippy bag a few free from the Range Rover and takes aim into the Range Rover from the back passenger door which was supposedly left open by Mick Steele and shoots all three men. Pat Tate is incapacitated after receiving a shot to his liver. Um, he has moved... Um, position, uh, slouching down, uh, wincing in pain. He then sees Tony Tucker turn round and, and shoots him twice in quick concession. The first shot hitting his right side of his face, 
uh, just in front of the ear. The second shot hitting his right cheek just under the ear. Craig Rolf is also turning around and the headrest is in the way. Jack has to adjust his stance and shoot at the headrest hitting Craig Rolf in the back of the head killing him instantly. This was also his closest target. This was all over in seconds. Mick Steele has left the gate and is now stood near Craig Rolf's door. Jack steps back and gets the other gun out of the chippy bag. I'm, I'm not entirely convinced two guns were used but I am going on Darren Nichols' second statement. Mick Steele gets handed the gun by Jack and he aims the gun at Pat Tate who is still alive uh, but wriggling about in pain. He fires but the gun backfires causing a quick flash and the gun falls apart. Um, this bit it just doesn't convince me. I mean, it would have been a totally different story if the gun Jack used first was the gun that fell apart. Um, anyway, Jack passes Mick his shotgun as they have a pact and Mick has to keep his word and this pact. He leans in to the open back passenger door and has a straight aim with no head movement from Tony Tucker as he's now dead. The four foot long barrel self loading shotgun is touching the back of Tony Tucker's head and Mick Steele pulls the trigger. This shot caused the most damage out of the three. This shot caused his face to almost split in two. Mick Steele then goes to Craig Rolf's driver's door, opens it up and fires at close range, leaving a gaping wound on the right side of his face. Even though Tony Tucker and Craig Rolf were already shot and killed by Jack, Mick Steele has to shoot them too as they have made a pact and have to shoot them all separately so neither could say the other did it. Mick Steele shuts the driver's door and walks round the front of the Range Rover and is stood near Tony Tucker's front passenger door. He sees Pat Tate slumped on the back door, his head leaning on the window making slight movements, wincing in pain. Mick Steele aims the gun at the window and shoots, causing the window to smash, catching Pat Tate's head uh, with a deep missile graze. Mick Steele is not entirely convinced that shot has finished Pat Tate off, so he walks past the tree branches and foliage. Mick Steele is now facing the other way at Pat Tate's window, where half of the window has been shot through. He now has a clear aim and fires the last shot into the left part of the back of his head. This shot causes the most damage and kills Pat Tate. Was it a contract killing, or did the men know and trust their assassin?
with the pact between Mick and Jack, is this how Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe were executed? As I did this scenario of the executions, all the cartridges fell near to where every shot was fired, uh, bar the one that was missing. Uh, the scenario of where I said Mick Steele, after shooting Tony Tucker and Crane Rolfe at close range, uh, the impact of these shots would have caused blood to splatter on him also. Uh, so as he walked around the Range Rover um, to shoot Pat Tate, then climbed through the tree bushes and foliage to get to the back part of the window where Pat Tate was uh, slumped in, um, in, in blood, it, he would have had had that over him um, from Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe, it would have transferred um, onto the tree branches and foliage. Um, I understand um, one trainer print was found at the crime scene, um, a size 7 trainer. Um, what size trainer is uh, Mick Steele? So, did Mick Steele and, and, and Jack Wounds make a pact that they would both shoot all three men separately, um, Jack going first, uh, then passing the gun on to Mick Steele, and then he shoots them all too? Is this why they don't speak about what really happened down the track that night? They have a lifelong pact that neither shall speak about the night in Rettenden and those murders. After all these years, they have never spoken about that night. Is it because of the lifelong pact they made prior to carrying out the executions of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe? Um, I shall finish this video here, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, the Pact Trilogy. Um, like I said, um, I had to turn the Pact uh, between Mick Steele and Jack Wounds, made prior to the murders, um, into a three-parter, as there were a lot of information um, to fit in. Um, if you haven't seen the Pact one yet, it is on my YouTube channel, um, The Essex Boys Murder Case Part 41. Uh, with number two being uh, 42, and then of course this one being um, 43. Uh, I mean, the amount of research and effort that went into the Pact trilogy was unbelievable. Uh, I mean, it took a lot out of me making this three-parter. Um, but do you know what? I did it for the YouTube subscribers and the people who enjoy watching my, my videos on the Facebook group, uh, which goes on a week later. Um, I'll make them for you, um, so I hope you've enjoyed them. Um, my next set of videos are going to be based on if Mick, Jack and possibly Dara Nichols hired a hitman um, to carry out these executions. Um, I'm just working on them at the moment, um, so they shouldn't be too long before they get uploaded onto my uh, YouTube channel. Um, so okay, that's it for today. Um, before I go, I'd just like to thank the admins for helping um, keeping the group ticking over. Um, it's much appreciated. And until next time, take care.